are samples of complex exponentials. Uh, voila, so formulas disappear. You can, of course, derive the formula. Uh, you derive the formula, uh, and it's uh, and the derivation was obviously completely geometric. We were simply projecting. We defined what scalar product is, what the basis vectors were. We showed that the basis is orthogonal. And if you divide by square root m, then it's orthonormal. In books, it's not, sometimes it's not normalized by square root n, uh, right? But uh, uh, it is. Uh, just one over n of the vector. So this part will be not normalized. And this guy is not normalized. This guy has one square root of n, another square root of n. So you get one over n. But it's better in this way because it keeps, it's the most geometrically intuitive and keeps both forward and backward transform uh, with uh, imperfect uh, um, symmetry, OK? So the discrete Fourier transform is just the sig. So what are then these guys? Well, they multiply these complex exponentials. So their absolute value will be the length of this vector. Right, so the uh, you then have right that. Uh, oh, let's see. Let me now erase this on the top. projection of vector x to the vector that looks like this, e to i 2 pi divided by n uh, times m, right, times uh, k, where, uh, let's see, let's call this, uh, yeah, yeah, m. Uh, so this is divided by, so when k goes from 0 to n minus 1, right, divided by square root n, uh, this times the very same vector e to the i 2 pi n times m times k, when k goes from 0 to n minus 1 divided by square root n. Right? So this is vector whose values are obviously simply samples of complex exponentials. And uh, you can now see you have square root here and square root here. You can pull it out uh, and uh, get that uh, x is equal 1 over n sum n equals from 0 to n minus 1. This here is called um, x m hat, right? Because um, times, uh, uh, times, uh, no, I should call it here, uh, let me see. Okay, n equals zero uh, times uh, uh, this we called uh, phi 
um, and So discrete Fourier transform is just the sequence, the coordinates of vector x in the new basis. But so you see, you can write now xm. You can write it as a form absolute value of xm times e to the i times arg of uh, um, uh, of xm. Right? Now this is called the magnitude and this is called the phase. Right? Because when you multiply this by that, this will increase each coordinate by this factor and each coordinate will be shifted by addition of this angle argument of x. Now the question is, uh, so the idea behind this is that we want these uh, to tell us, um, in fact, with this notation you can write x is equal sum of absolute value of xm times uh, cosine 2 pi k m divided by n uh, plus i times sine 2 pi k uh, m divided by um, n. Um, uh, uh, this will be the k coordinate. So x k coordinate is then written in this form. And this tells you, you see, oh, and we have to multiply this uh, by, um, okay, so let's, let's write it in exponential notation. So times uh, square root n on the bottom, and this is um, the vector of, uh, oh, well, let me not do it now, we will do it uh, uh, when we, show uh, geometric a, a little bit later. Okay, so simply this absolute value of this tells you with what intensity uh, each frequency uh, m is present, right? And uh, um, the, this guy argument simply um, I guess this is hat here, hat here, hat here, will have the effect of just uh, shifting this complex exponential uh, for, uh, for this uh, magnitude. So, um, let me see. Um, Yeah, it would be messy if I write it in a vector notation, so we will do it a little bit like that. So, but is this really true? Is it really true that uh, uh, if I give you, say, sum of two complex exponentials, uh, sorry, or two sine waves, will Fourier transform find precisely just these two harmonics? And this is what we are going to do next. We will run a mathematical simulation that will tell you everything about that. And it's really extremely interesting. So how do I start? The,
You see, everything, I mean, formulas just came by themselves. By simply knowing how we drew the basis and uh, um, um, what is the definition of a scalar product. And voila, the formulas for discrete Fourier transform simply, you know, they simply show themselves uh, automatically without you having to memorize absolutely anything. And this is, uh, I wish they let me teach signal processing here, but a tough life. Uh, let me see. I want to show you just one second. Bear with me a moment. So you open this. Where is my box? Then we go to the forces. Okay, piece of cake. So now, this is what we are doing here. We are taking a simple signal. Here it is, cosine 2 pi times 3t divided by 64, phase shifted a little bit plus 1 half, plus 2 times cosine 7 pi, uh, sorry, 2 pi times 7t over 64. So the frequency of the first component is, two, uh, is 6 pi over 64, of the second component 14 pi over 64. And uh, we tell Mathematica that uh, this is indeed what we want by evaluating this bit. Okay? Then we choose to take uh, 64 samples of this. Uh, these are two sine. Sine is the same as cosine, right? Uh, uh, sine waves. Uh, and we take 64 samples, right? And then uh, let's see what this uh, looks like. Uh, voila, these are the samples, then they are joined uh, with lines uh, so that it's easier to see. So you can see uh, it's not completely kind of uniform because they are uh, two kind of two sides of waves, so they introduce beat, right? In music, it's called beat. Um, they interfere with each other, right? So let's take now the Fourier transform. How do we take the Fourier transform? Well, <coughs> we simply multiply, uh, we produce these complex exponentials, we complex conjugate them, and then find the scalar product with our uh, vector. And lo and behold, here it is. Of course, is this how we do, how we find the discrete Fourier transform in practice? How do you find the discrete Fourier transform of, uh, of, of, for the size of 64 vector in practice? This is a matrix multiplication. This is quadratic. This is 64 by 64 times 64. So that will be 64 squared. Uh, times 64, so it will be lots of multiplications. How do we find discrete Fourier transform in practice? Uh, have you taken 3, 1, 2, 1? 
FFT, exactly. So you can do it in log n log n time, right? Because if you did it by brute force, when you multiply back matrix by a vector, it would be n multiplications for each uh, row, so n squared multiplications and that's low, but FFT does it fast. Okay, let's plot the Fourier transform, discrete Fourier transform of this signal. And here it is. This is one, two, three, four. So the fourth pin and five, six, seven, uh, seventh pin, right? Is it? A, uh, this is precisely uh, where the uh, the frequencies were. But why are there four peaks? You see. There are four peaks because our signal is real, but the basis vectors are complex. So in order to produce a real sine wave, you need the complex sine wave and its complex conjugant to cancel out the imaginary part. So if there were two complex sine waves, it would be two peaks. But because here we have a, a real sine wave, there are four peaks. And exactly the peaks are, right, we start with zero. So the first dot is zero, one, two, uh, three, and then uh, up to seven. So it looks really that uh, and the amplitudes of the oscillations are, is uh, <coughs> one to two, precisely as they are here, one and two. Higher frequency is two, and voila. So you see, discrete Fourier transform told us uh, what frequencies are present. But is it always so nice? Let's take another signal which is almost exactly the same as the first signal, except instead of 3, I use 3.5. And here, instead of, uh, was it 8, 7, or 8, I forget. So this is now non-integer. But all our sine waves have <coughs> integer multiples of 2 pi over n. So how can it be that uh, that frequencies that fall in between can be represented. Well, this, in fact, you can see what happens. So these are just the samples of the signal. And here we compute its discrete Fourier transform. What happened here? Let's see. Um, let's see what it looks like. And look what happens. Now it's a total mess. The frequencies are between these two peaks. Right? So what DFT has to do, it has to combine all of the available harmonics to synthesize something of intermediate frequency. So instead of just having four peaks, now you have eight peaks plus all this mess that is used to compensate for the mismatch, right? Because all of your frequencies of these guys are of the integer multiples of 2 pi over n. But these guys are not. So you need heaps of them. And so this kind of defeats your spectral gut feeling that you want this to produce an accurate description of what's present. So we, walk, we don't have time to go into this. This can be remedied by something called windowing. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, let us see. So assume now, so what is the whole business of Jacob? I will explain to you JPEG uh, in 1D. 
because JPEG in 2D is uh, something called tensor product of two one-dimensional uh, <coughs> JPEG, so to speak, because the basis of JPEG is uh, separable. It is just a product of functions in one dimension times functions in another dimension. Separates into product according to coordinates. <coughs> but let us, so the idea of JPEG is this. Image consists of patterns. But these patterns are not now time domain oscillations, but they are uh, spatial oscillations. But this doesn't make much difference, right? Now, the point is, if the picture is not just noise, only a few of these components are needed to very accurately represent the image. Because this going up and down right, is confined only to several frequencies. But the problem is now this. If you do, if you use FFT to, um, uh, to represent which frequencies are present, you have all of these guys uh, that without them, the picture will be rather crappy. So these guys are artifacts of two things. First, here in this example, the frequency was not in integer multiple of 2 pi over m. But another important thing happened. And this is where the trick, main trick of JPEG lies. So let us do the following. Um, I will take these two signals and evaluate them not over one period, but I will copy. You see, these guys are obviously periodic, right? with the period 2 pi n times n, right? So I can do it over, I simply plot here the very same function, but over two periods. That's the first function when you have integer frequencies. And then I do exactly the same with the second function. And these two functions, so these are just two periods, right, of the very same, right, I simply copied this here, right, because in the representation, we are representing everything with 2 pi over n times n periodic functions. So, <coughs> What is the main difference between these two plots? Can you see it? Concentrate on the junction between the two periods. What happens on top? What happens on bottom? What is the difference of this region versus the same region up to there? Look how it goes. Red dots climb up, and then they continue from the same point, and they climb down. What happens here? You see, left end is large positive value. Right end is large negative value. And between the two, the signal, this 2, this, uh, two pi over n periodic signal, has to make a very steep jump. And this is what creates the artifacts. You see, um, let me just um, draw here a picture. Because we were, it's easier to see if I draw it continuous. The first one looked like this. And we represented approximately right with the trigonometric function. So the next period will be just 
like that. But the second function looks like this. On the next period, it will look like this. So between these two points, the function has to make a very sharp increase. Because the left end and the right end mismatch. And this is, uh, in fact, uh, the main explanation why all this mass happens. It's not only that the frequencies are in between, but these, so here, these are the high frequencies, right? Because this goes 2 pi over 64, uh, then 2 pi times 2 <coughs> over 64, and so forth. So these high frequencies here are necessary to make the jump between two consecutive periods. Uh, we want to avoid, you see, nature abhors discontinuity. So we want to avoid never to have something like that. And JPEG does a simple but colossal trick. What JPEG does, it simply says, uh, take your signal and mirror image it. So here is your signal that looks, uh, say, like this. And then create a mirror image of it. So double the number of points and create something that looks like that. Now, a fortiori, if you represent this signal, that is concocted of the original signal plus a reflected signal. The jumps disappear. You have perfect match both here and here by symmetry. There is still discrepancy, but it is mild. What do you think? What is this continuous, possibly discontinuous at this point? The derivative, the really here it is. If what if my signal looks like this? Right? Then the mirror image will look like this. So I'll have cusps here and here because the function is not smooth. It's continuous, but not continuously differentiable. But the penalty for discontinuity of the first derivative, you see, the interpolatory functions are perfectly smooth. They are differentiable everywhere. They are just sine, sines and cosines. So you are now approximating a non-differentiable function by differentiable functions, so there will be penalty. But the penalty for discontinuity of the first derivative is minuscule compared to discontinuity of the um, of the value of the function itself. So let's see when we do that. Where do we do that? We do it here. So what did I cook up here? Let's see. I did uh, the following. I simply took the original samples and then shifted them from for m and reversed the order, right? Because here indices decrease, here indices increase. And I join the two together, and I plot. And here it is. So this is now mirror image of that. Let's see what its discrete Fourier transform looks like. Well, now we have two and many points. So you will have to use larger matrix, but the technicalities aside, this is what you get. Now compare this guy with that guy. All the high frequencies, almost all the high frequencies are gone. 
because the function no longer has to make the jump between the two complete periods. So if you are to compress something, you can ignore huge number of samples and encode only the really large ones. And that's the reason why we use discrete Fourier, sorry, discrete cosine transform instead of discrete Fourier transform. Just to mitigate the discontinuity between the periods, and lo and behold, you can see that it works beautifully. Yes? Why is it called discrete cosine transform? But we will see in a second why it's called discrete cosine transform. Now, but this guy still has a problem. Why? Because this is only the magnitude of the coefficients, but the coefficients are complex. So they have a imaginary part and a real part. And uh, this is uh, so the number of, so the number of points doubled. But this is not a problem because the picture is symmetric, so you can chop it in half, but you still have a real and imaginary part. Can you make it purely real? In order to make it real, you have to have conjugate symmetry. So uh, what you have to have is uh, that uh, if you read it backwards uh, from left to right, uh, you have to get complex conjugates of what you read from right to left because then the imaginary part will cancel out. To do that, you do a very simple trick. You do the discrete Fourier transform and then you multiply it with this little factor. Uh, so you multiply the discrete Fourier transform by this small factor, which is 2 pi over 2m, k over 2. So this is 2 pi k over 2. And now you can see analytically it's easy to compute, but you can simply see here in the simulation if you uh, do if you do this rotation for this vector, all the values are real, and moreover they they, they are uh, anti-symmetric. Uh, numbers here are negative numbers here, so you can chop off and instead of <coughs> and instead of 128, you can reduce it to uh, just 64 real coefficients. Uh, let's see what the plot of these coefficients uh, look like. Okay, um, let's see, do I have, okay, uh, it's actually a little bit, uh, um, well, we can do it here, I guess, we can do uh, a list plot, and then list plot, and then uh, apps, and then uh, uh, how do I call it? D C O S T. D C S D C O D C O S T. Ah, what is this? Oh, we list. Sorry, I don't have my reading glasses, so I am only one. Okay. Uh, Oh, this is with prior to, okay, we just ignore this. Uh, now, these guys, uh, right, I, I should take, uh, uh, yeah, okay, let's see. Okay, let me first finish it. You see, instead of taking the Fourier transform of the symmetrized signal and then uh, rotating it uh, by this angle to make it real. 
you can use a different basis that is already slightly rotated. What is the basis? The basis is this, right? Uh, instead of pi times j times k, the, this rotation factor has been incorporated here, right? And now what you can see is, uh, with a little bit of algebra, that uh, because this guy is symmetric, imaginary parts cancel out, the signs cancel out, and this formula reduces to this. And this answer your question. It is reducible to a, a real product in which the projected, you know, the basis functions are simply the cosines. <coughs> but of course, the, it's assumed that the entra, entry vector is uh, symmetric as well, input vector is symmetric. Inverse formula uh, looks like this, uh, and this is usually called uh, discrete cosine transform of type 2, uh, because there are variants of this depending what you want to accomplish, but this one is the most important and what's used in JPEG. Uh, and so, you get, um, if you do this transformation, right, um, let's now see, first you get exactly the same as before, these two cancel, and let us plot now the discrete Fourier transform, oops, what did happen here? I missed something here, I missed this bit here. So this shows that this basis, slightly rotated basis, is also an orthonormal, but it is no longer symmetric because of this shift. So in order to get the inverse matrix, you don't just complex conjugate, you also transpose. This is called uh, uh, Hermitian transpose, right? So you have to conjugate and flip the matrix around, but then you get an orthonormal basis and everything works like a charm. So let us now see uh, what uh, the plots look like. Okay, so now look at this. Oh, well, we have a 